My name is Stephen McCree and I'm a principal dancer at the Royal Opera House. I grew up in Sydney, Australia, and I'm originally from a motorsport family, so the complete contrast and opposite, I guess you could say, of the ballet world. My father was a drag racer and an auto electrician by trade, so my sister and I grew up at racetracks, cars, nitromethane, and my mother and father were very passionate about it, and we drove up and down the coast of the east coast of Australia. Um, obviously as a family supporting my my father's passion and my mother also loved it as well uh, my sister a little bit older than me was a brilliant gymnast and she trained regularly and also danced a lot and when i was seven i went into my mother and father and just said i would like to have a go and so my mom and dad took me to this local school that happened to be around the corner and all these years later i now realize that that school it was pure luck that it was there. Those teachers were some of the best you will find in the world. And that initial training really laid down the foundations, not only for my technique that I'm able to use to dance, but this unknown passion for dance that I didn't know I had. I just wanted to do it. And uh, my parents and I just happened to stumble across this school. Pure chance. Australia's obviously an incredible country and very heavily dominated by sport and the arts have always been important out there and they continue to grow and get more and more support but my childhood was not really focused on the arts uh, my my family you know always made the the effort to take us into the city we didn't live right in the city center we were about an hour away so we would like many children i guess go and watch things like Disney on ice and shows like that, that obviously were very commercial. And my father was always recording things for me. Uh, even before he knew that I had this burning passion to dance, he was always showing little clips of, you know, Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire or something like that. My family didn't really have that much exposure to live theater. Um, they've, I guess, learned more and more about it as I've learned about it and developed my career, um, you know, they now come and watch me and they come to the Royal Opera House in London every, occasionally. And I guess like everyone in the, in the general public is bowled over and wowed by this incredible building. And obviously these productions that are put on by, you know, the Opera and Ballet Company, which are two of the best in the world, um, that they're, they're just blown away by it. And of course they don't, really understand exactly what it takes and, and, and what's involved, but they understand the passion that it takes and obviously the commitment that it takes. They were there with me through my whole childhood supporting that. So at the age of seven, I went to my parents and said, I would like to have a go. I would like to dance. And uh, they never ever questioned it. They just said, okay, great. I think they probably thought I would last a week and then say, I don't want to do this anymore. I was incredibly shy. Um, not the healthiest of children, uh, you know, severe asthma, um, not the strongest <laughs> of little boys and, and very quiet hiding behind my mom's leg. But the first day I stepped into the dance studio, this teacher that I had, Natisha Celio in Australia, just, she said to me, jump as high as you can, spin as fast as you can just be free and I, I can still picture that first day it, it was an incredibly 
powerful moment, I guess you could say. It was a real turning point. I found this inner confidence. Of course, as soon as the lesson finished and the door closed, I went back into the quiet little boy. But there was this unknown world that I was suddenly introduced to that I fell in love with. I've always had teachers in Australia that encouraged me to push the boundaries. They were always saying, okay, you did that particular turn, add another turn, or okay, you jumped that high, now jump higher. There was such a technical element to it, but it was never based on trying to be perfect. It was trying to be as free as you can be. And I guess they always focused on the passion. So it was not necessarily telling a story with what I was doing, and it wasn't being a gymnast at just executing steps. It was just pure freedom. Um, and I was very lucky that they encouraged me to do multiple styles. They, they said it was like your academic training. Your dance training needs to be varied. So at, at academic school, you don't just do maths. You have to do your science and English. And it was the same at my dance school. We, we all did jazz and tap and ballet, you know, a bit of hip hop. Uh, I ended up doing a bit of Spanish and flamingo. Um, it was very varied. And I think that has helped definitely now in, in the Royal Ballet where the, the repertoire is so varied. Um, you can't just be a pigeonhole ballet dancer anymore. The very first time I stepped on stage, I was uh, seven years old. Uh, it was in a big group number with other you know, friends of mine at the dance school. And then at the age of eight, I stepped on stage for the first time as a solo. And it was in a competition uh, it was a tap solo, about two, two and a half minutes long. Uh, I was tiny, I had little black trousers on and a, like a, a maroon reddish shirt with a black bow tie. And uh, very, very young and just totally stepping on stage into this unknown world. And um, at the time, obviously, I, th I think it was quite daunting, but I remember coming off stage thinking, I need to do it again. I need to go back out again. I realize now that I was hooked. I wanted to go back on stage again and again and again. I, I enjoyed what that sensation felt like, that combination of a bit of nerves, anxiety, adrenaline, the buzz of when you finish the routine. To experience that at such a young age, I think is without sounding cliche, it's quite a gift for a child to feel that at such a young age. Many adults go through their whole life never having that kind of sensation. I guess, you know, going on a roller coaster or something is something to mimic that sensation, but um, to, to experience that at such a young age definitely was the point that I said, I need to do this much longer. I obviously didn't know at that age though that you could do it professionally. That came much later in life. So I was very lucky to have incredibly supportive parents from the beginning. And very quickly, the, the amount of lessons I was doing started to add up. You know, I started age seven doing, I think it was two days a week. You, you go for an hour and just jump around a bit. By the age of, you know, age nine, I was already dancing six days a week. Now, it was not a school that had academics and dance combined at all. My parents were very clear from day one that my academics had to be my priority. And I maintained that <laughs> I had to keep my, my scores up and focus at school. But as soon as the bell went at three o'clock, uh, I was in the car or on the train and at the dance studio until as late as I possibly could. And that carried through. Uh, you know, up until I was about 16 years old. I was very lucky that I had teachers throughout that process from the age of seven to 16 that acknowledged what they were capable of doing and how far they could take me. And then they acknowledged, it's now time for you to go to someone else. And that's a huge credit to them because it's very easy as a teacher to just hold on to someone. Uh, so I had teachers who were obviously very intelligent that knew it's time for you to go to this one. Now it's time for you to go to that one. Um, my tap teacher um, has been the constant throughout. And uh, my most recent ballet teacher, Hilary Kaplan, I met her when I was about 12, 13 years old. And I trained very intensely with her. 
uh, right up until I joined the Royal Ballet School. And she was the one that made me aware that a career in ballet was even possible. As I started to progress with my ballet with Hilary Kaplan, I was then suddenly exposed to companies like the Royal Ballet. I didn't know anything about the Royal Ballet. I thought it was in Melbourne or something. I was not from that world, so I, I just was totally unaware of it. And uh, Hilary started to show me videos of you know, Sir Anthony Dow, and obviously then I saw further videos of Nureyev and Barishnikov and incredible male dancers like that, that obviously made my eyes open up and go, wow, okay, there's something again, so unknown about this world that fascinates me. And then actually it was my father that recorded um, a gala from the Royal Opera House. And there was the Swamp Pas de Deux, Man on Act Three, and it was Sylvie Guillaume and Jonathan Cope performing it. And my father recorded this gala and I remember fast forwarding through it all. And then this Pas de Deux came on and of course, I'd never seen anything like this. And of course, those two dancers together, just incredible. And from that part of der, watching that in that gala, that's the moment I said, I am pursuing a ballet career. I fell in love with that part of der and I fell in love with the idea that, that your body was telling this incredible story and it was so powerful. And, um, it's been quite an amazing journey to be able to go from seeing that pas de deux for the first time to actually perform it on that same stage. That is something I still can't quite fathom. So all the support in the world I had from my parents, my teachers, very lucky. But sometimes finances play a part and there was no way that my family could fund me to go all the way to the other side of the world to one of the most expensive schools in the world. The Royal Ballet School was on the top of my list. That's where I wanted to go. And my teacher, Hilary Kaplan, was determined that that is where you will go. There was no question in her mind. Uh, to have a teacher that has that faith in you and belief in you is so powerful. Um, so she said, right, you're going to the Prix de Lausanne, huge competition in Switzerland and the prizes are scholarships to the best schools and companies in the world. I was completely out of my depth. I arrived in Switzerland, first time in Europe. It was snowing. I left Sydney, it was 40 degrees. A uh, huge culture shock. Obviously just listening to the different language I thought was incredibly beautiful, but again, just so foreign and alien to me. Then I walk into the theater in Lausanne and the stage is raked. I didn't even know anything like that existed, of course. Um, so anyway, I was very fortunate that through that competition, um, I had the support of the judges, the incredibly <laughs> wonderful Gaylene Stock, who unfortunately is no, no longer with us, was the head of the jury that year. And she uh, took me aside and said, I want you to join the Royal Ballet School. And I understand your situation and I don't think you should fly all the way back to Australia tomorrow to then have to come back in six months time. You will fly to London tomorrow morning and you will start your, your new life at the Royal Ballet School. It was an incredibly dramatic and um, life-changing moment. I went from this little kid in Sydney to being offered first prize at the Prix de Lausanne and first choice of what school I wanted to go to with the director saying, come tomorrow. So my mother flew with me to London. She was there for two days and then that was it. She had to go back to Australia. And uh, I was there in London with a suitcase, which had not very much in it. It had a Corsair costume and a pair of tap shoes because that's what I used at the competition. And yeah, my, my new chapter, began at the Royal Ballet School and it was a very steep learning curve from day one. So the day after the Prix de Lausanne, it was uh, beginning of 2003, I landed in London and said goodbye to my, my mom and I, I joined the Royal Ballet School and it was 
a huge culture change and culture shock from day one. I was um, put into the second year of the upper school. So it was halfway through the year, which meant that those students had a year and a half remaining of their training. Many of the students had been through the lower school, which is called White Lodge in Richmond Park. So many of them had grown up together since the age of 10 or 11. They understood the institute. They were exposed to the company. Uh, it was ingrained in them. They knew not necessarily how everything worked, but they were exposed to it. I had never seen a full length ballet before live. So my second day at the school, um, I was taken across the road to the company. They were preparing Makarova's Sleeping Beauty at the time. And they needed students to hold a tray of cups in the hunt scene in act two. And so I was one of those students. And I remember being sat at the back of the Devour studio. And that was actually the day I met my wife, Elizabeth Harrod. And I was obviously overwhelmed with everything. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, it was just a lot to take on. Suddenly I'm living on the other side of the world by myself. And here I am in the Royal Ballet's studios watching the actual company rehearse. And I am part of this production now. It was a lot to take on. Then, you know, the next rehearsal, everyone said, oh, it's, it's, they're going to do the Rose Adage. And, and it's Darcy. Now I got excited because I knew who Darcy was. Um, I didn't know many people, but I knew who she was, but I didn't know what the Rose Adage was. I, I couldn't understand why they're getting all excited. What's this Rose Adage thing? And of course I watched it and was bowled over and blown away. I just thought it was the most incredible thing in the world. So within a few weeks, I stepped on the Royal Opera House stage. I was holding a, a tray of drinks, but I was on this Royal Opera House stage that I had seen these videos of the greats dancing on. When I joined the school, there was so much more involved in making that transition than I could ever have imagined. In Australia, it, I was with other students, but it was very much one-on-one -on -one attention with my teacher a lot of the time. So to join the Royal Ballet School, where there were you know, 15 boys in my class and obviously 15 girls and suddenly doing pas de deux classes and things like this, which I hadn't really done much of, repertoire classes, learning repertoire of ballets that I couldn't even pronounce what the names were. It was so foreign and new to me. But somehow I was excited by all of it. I, I found some elements difficult. I thought that, um, I thought everyone would just be so hungry to want to succeed and develop and get better every single day. And I quickly learned that obviously everyone's human and, um, people approach their work very different. But I was very lucky again to have teachers that understood what I was going through. Uh, the director of the, the Royal Ballet School now, Christopher Powney, was my teacher when I joined. And I still to this day thank him for being so patient with me because I was incredibly homesick, but still determined and you know, driven to, to follow through this dream of mine. Uh, he had to put up with a lot. But again, with the support of Gaylene Stock, the director, and her husband, Gary Norman, I was able to graduate, and Monica Mason gave me a contract at the end of that graduate year. I think I performed Les Nos as a student with the company, uh, thrown on at the last minute, like many students are. And for anyone that's danced Les Nos, they'll understand the stress and pressure that that can cause anyone, let alone a student that is trying to get a job. But thankfully, I was given a contract soon after that. And I started the following season with the Royal Ballet Company. A lot of the culture that I grew up in was very competition driven. You know, Australians love a competition for everything, whether it's academic, sport, arts. But in a lot of the dance schools in Australia, a lot of the students compete in competitions regularly. You could do a competition every weekend if you wanted to in Australia. And they're not huge competitions, but they're opportunities for you to turn up at a, a theater or a huge school hall. And you would have to perform all these different solos that you had prepared. I would sometimes do like 20 different solos at one competition because I would 
have all my tap solos and I'd have all my, my classical stuff, I'd have my jazz. There were improvisation sections. And of course, many people laugh at that and think, oh, competitions are awful. But it was such a vital part of my training. I was on stage regularly. And sometimes, you know, my teachers would finish choreographing that solo the day before. So I wasn't rehearsing something for six months and dancing it. It was, this is what you've got to do, now perform it and make it work. And of course, a number of times I'd be on stage and I wouldn't be able to remember exactly what was going on, but you just made it work. You were performing and they're all little skills and traits that I am so grateful that I learned from a young age because in a ballet company now, you, you don't have six months to prepare for your debut in a role. You, if you have three weeks, that's a luxury. Um, and it's, it's definitely helped me now in my professional life. When I joined the Royal Ballet School, of course, all those competitions ended. It was a very different culture. But I was on stage, not obviously as often, but still regularly because I was able to work with the Royal Ballet Company. And okay, of course I was not in the middle of the stage doing the big variation and all those dream roles, but those you know, 18 months being a student with the company were vital. I was stood on stage, able to feel this buzz, able to watch how people are behaving, how they're holding themselves, what is it that they're, they're saying? Um, huge moment was, uh, as a student, I was a beggar in Manon. And of course, Manon was the, the ballet that I saw in that gala video when I was very young. And that was the moment that I said I wanted to do ballet. So there I am, a beggar, on stage, with the actual cast that I saw on that video. Uh, beyond surreal to be on stage. Yes, I was a beggar student, but I was on that stage, meant to be asleep, but with my eye open, watching Sylvie Guillaume and Jonathan Cope perform Manon. I mean, that alone is a whole career worth of learning, just watching them do one pas de deux, especially at that age as a student. So it was a very different culture. The, the amount of times I was on stage, yes, it varied. And what I was doing on stage was nothing like I was doing when I was in the competitions in Australia. But I needed to do those 18 months with the school to just have a taste of what is this professional world like and, and what does it involve. Of course, when I joined the company, the real learning began. And every time I was promoted or given a new role, it was like you were starting from scratch every single time. And, the day I was promoted to principal was genuinely when I said, now the hard work begins. Um, I guess it's very easy to say I've made it, but it was very much the opposite. So I joined the company in 2004 and like every aspiring student, joined the corps de ballet and was just hungry to learn. And my first day in the company, I remember looking around the bar and you had Sylvie Guillaume, Darcy Bustle, Tamara Rojo, Alina Kojikaru, um, you had Marinella, Miyako Yoshida, you had all these incredible ballerinas. Then you looked over the other bar and you had Carlos Acosta, Johan Koborg, Jonathan Cope, just incredible humans and, and artists. It was impossible not to learn, <laughs> simply. And uh, so I just remember trying to watch as much as I could. If I was not in a rehearsal myself, I would sit at the door and just watch a principal couple rehearse. And um, that first season, actually, Symphonic Variations was part of the repertoire. And it was the final program of the season. And my name was put up to understudy Johan Koborg. And everybody was in shock and said, do you understand what this is? I had no idea, no idea. And I was made aware of it very quickly when I was told a bit about the history of the ballet and what it meant to the company. And so I went to rehearsals and made sure I, I knew it inside and out. And unfortunately, another dancer was injured, I think it was about two days before the opening night. And uh, the, the lady teaching the ballet at the time said, do you know it? 
And I just said yes, instantly, without any hesitation. And that was it. The next day I did the dress rehearsal with Johan Koborg and Federico Bonelli, two incredible principal dancers, and me on the side. <laughs> and uh, so then the day after that, I did the opening night. I was thrown in in my first season, which was incredible. And again, it's impossible not to learn from that experience and that exposure. Then the following season, you know, incredible opportunities and things happened. And then before I knew it, I was doing Romeo and Juliet with Alina and Kojukaru on the opening night. Unfortunately, Johan Koborg got injured. And so I had five days to learn an entire production. I'd not really done pas de deux, especially of that kind. And I'd never acted in that way before. I'd never held a sword to do a sword fight before. Uh, there was a lot, a lot to learn. And that all happened very quickly. It was a bit of a whirlwind. And of course I thought, this is incredible. I'm living the dream. This is what I dreamt about when I watched those videos back in Australia. And uh, of course my body shut down and said, this is too much, too quick. Um, I partially ruptured my left Achilles. And some doctors originally were not that positive, saying that I would never dance again and I would have a limp for the rest of my life. Uh, thankfully, I found a doctor that was a little bit more glass half full and said, no, you will, you will walk totally fine and you will dance again if you listen to me. And I did, I, I followed his words like the gospel and uh, it took me virtually a year I was off stage for. I didn't cope very well with my first injury. I was so young and hungry that I didn't know how to channel all this energy that I had. Uh, and the first few months, I think, I was possibly in just denial of what was going on. But uh, Monica Mason sent me back home to Australia for uh, a longer summer break and said, just get away from everything. And uh, then I came back and started the rehab process. And luckily I had Leslie Collier, who's still my coach today. And she, without holding my hand and walking me on stage, got me back on that stage. It was such a career changing moment to have an injury like that. And of course, at the time I thought it was the worst thing in the world and the brilliant Liam Benjamin actually came up to me and said, you're very lucky that you have this so young. And I didn't understand at the time what she meant. I thought, how can you say that? You have no idea what I'm going through. But she said, no, 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 you, you're very lucky to have this at a young age. You will learn from it and um, you last much longer because of it. And uh, she was right. She was very much right. I learned so much from that year off stage. I was able to distance myself from the profession and what I was so focused on doing and actually watch and observe the art form. I was able to watch so many performances from different points of the auditorium. Uh, I would sit in the wings and watch and if there was a spare seat, Monica Mason would say after act one, there's a seat over there or there or there. It was a very big opportunity for me to learn and I didn't want to waste that opportunity. Of course, I wanted to come back stronger and healthier, but I also wanted to come back uh, wiser and with a broader view on what the art form could possibly be and what it could mean to me. Exactly. The time off stage, it, it did many things for me professionally, but it, something that I hold on to is that it taught me what is important and perhaps what's a little less important, what we all get so hung up about and caught up about and think that's what's important to make a good performance is not necessarily what the audience see. And ultimately the performances that I enjoyed watching the most during that time were the performances that you could see the, the, the dancers, the artists were just losing themselves in that moment. They were not trying to be perfect or not make a mistake or don't do a little wobble because those little details 
ultimately don't really matter. Um, I felt like it influenced, influenced me in a way that I was able to, I guess, have a bit more of a mature approach to the way I rehearsed and performed when I returned. Uh, it definitely changed the way I conducted myself in rehearsals. I wouldn't just repeat something a hundred times for the sake of it. Uh, better to repeat it once and do it well <laughs> than just do it for the sake of it. When you're working with many choreographers at the same time and, or on different productions at the same time, you have to become very uh, efficient with your time and know how can I get through all of this work and still have a body at the end of it. And that time away from the stage was vital and valuable in helping me to, to manage that. Becoming a principal dancer with the Royal Ballet was obviously one of my ultimate dreams. I'd watched all these incredible videos and films of these iconic artists performing wonderful roles, and I wanted to do those roles as well. So the day I was promoted to principal of the Royal Ballet was huge for me. It was, of course, something I dreamt about but it was also an honour. And with that honour comes a huge responsibility. I, of course, being a principal dancer of the Royal Ballet, was suddenly opened up to a bigger dance world, perhaps going to dance with other companies or dancing with other ballerinas around the world. But I also saw that as more responsibility because every time I stepped off a plane somewhere, I was not only just representing myself, I was representing what the Royal Ballet is and what the Royal Ballet means. And it was not enough for me to just go and be me. And it still isn't. I still take my role as a, Royal, as a principal of the Royal Ballet very seriously. And I know that every time I perform, it's not just me performing. The roles that I've been able to do since becoming a principal are just out of this world. I've been able to tackle the iconic roles. Obviously, I, I did Romeo before I was promoted to principal, and I've been fortunate to perform that with something like nine or ten different Juliets since. It's a role I love, and I just enjoy returning to it every single time. Um, I, I tackled Sir Kenneth McMillan's Miling for the first time uh, two years ago. The dramatic roles are definitely something that I've enjoyed getting my teeth into and developing since becoming a principal. Uh, performing a role like Romeo at such a young age was kind of a nice step into that dramatic world because I was young and innocent and that is ultimately what Romeo is. Since then, obviously, developing roles like Rudolph in Miling is uh, a challenge, but something that I just I thrive off, I, I love losing myself in these characters that are so the opposite of how I live my life and how I think. But I, I love it, I go into the studio for that hour and a half and you become this other person or you have a, a role like the, the creature in Frankenstein created on you that simply is out of this world. It's not human. From a young age, I've just wanted to perform. I wanted to be on stage. Then as you grow up and through life, you, you, you alter your goals. You, you see a goal and then maybe you change it or you move it. Maybe you know you're reaching a goal, but by the time you've got there, you've already moved your, you've set your <laughs> sights on another goal already. Obviously I wanted to become a, a principal of the Royal Ballet and my hunger hasn't stopped since achieving that. There, there is always another role you want to do, and there's always things in life that you want to do. Uh, becoming a father since becoming a principal is simply my greatest achievement yet, and that is a challenge on a daily basis, and juggling that with a professional career as a principal dancer is um, no mean feat, let me tell you. My day now, on a show day, you know, is a little bit different to how it used to be. It can uh, start anywhere from you know 5 30 in the morning with children and uh, that's when we're up and we're up and about living our life with our children and uh, usually I, I try to leave the house about 9 a.m 
and I do my daily class at the Royal Opera House and maybe do a, you know, a few extra exercises if there is a need to have an extra rehearsal or something after class that is slotted in uh, directly after class. Uh, as a principal, I'm then fortunate to be able to rest for a few hours before the show starts. Very rarely do I have a sleep or anything the day of a show, though. I'm, when I wake up in the morning, my head's going in that direction. My head's on show mode. And um, the whole day for me is show mode until that curtain goes down. Of course, after that curtain goes down, I, I find it very difficult to to just switch off and go to sleep. Um, but when you know your children might be up at 5 or 5.30, when you can see that it's already 1 or 1.30, you're thinking, I have to go to sleep because <laughs> I'm going to be very up, <laughs> awake very early, uh, very soon. I've been so lucky to do so many great roles. The Raw Ballet's repertoire is so diverse and varied that it's impossible to ever feel that your career is stagnant or even possibly say that you're bored. And I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to work with so many different choreographers that challenge and push me. I guess thinking about roles I'd like to do, I'd say that they're roles that are yet to be created. I, I want roles to be created on me with the people I love performing with, roles that obviously challenged me technically and physically, but also dramatically. Like I said, I've been very fortunate to, to have some great roles created for me. That's what I want more of. I want to be pushed, challenged, uh, pushed out of my comfort zone. Let's see what the future holds.